Ah uh, yes, another day, another video. Thanks for joining me, and today we're going to be looking at yet another atheist content creator I had a run-in with, while he was pushing unevidenced, moral panicky bullshit on the internet. So, let's talk about it. I study oppressive authoritarian systems. It's literally what I spend all day, every day doing. Critical race theory has been instituted as a way to create authoritarian solutions to racism. It doesn't work and never will. It's bad for everyone connected with it. Having come fresh off making a video about CRT, this statement, made with absolute certainty, is absolute donkey piss. So, naturally, I gave into the Twitter demons and gave a cheeky reply. I asked Chris Shelton, critical thinker at large, what he had been studying that led him to that conclusion, because it sure as shit sounded like Fox News propaganda. To which he got mad, or pretended to get mad anyway, at my low level of sarcasm, instead of, you know, providing references. This led to him blocking me, which is fine. He's perfectly entitled to manage his social media platform and block people. However, I do find it super ironic that the guy who likes to wear a shirt that proclaims he's fluent in sarcasm is blocking people for entry-level sarcasm, instead of providing his sources. I guess this particular snowflake didn't put on his big boy pants before putting out dangerous misinformation and feeding into a moral panic. But I'm cool with blocking. Do what you need to do, right? The critical thinker at large then spent the rest of the day being mad and painting himself as the victim before finally declaring that he was going to take a few days break from Twitter because the jerks on Twitter bring out the worst in him. Only to return less than a day later. But, uh, no Chris. I'd say the worst part is you spreading misinformation about a topic that you clearly don't understand by using far-right talking points, which makes alt-writers and other racists feel comfortable in the atheist community. It allows them to feel welcome and feeds into their internal narrative that their racism and xenophobia is rationally justified because the critical thinker at large told them so. I mean, he's obviously one of the big brain rationalists. And he spent days studying it. He must know what he's talking about. Well, anyway, I flashed a few screenshots earlier and one of them does list a few sources, namely YouTube video interviews he's conducted about CRT. And I kid you fucking not at all, both were interviews with James Lindsay. The James Lindsay who endlessly spams a transphobic conservative one joke. Yeah, James, it, it wasn't funny the first time someone did it, but it sure as fuck isn't funny now, you wanker. The same James Lindsay who thinks that if any member of a minority group cares about systemic racism, transphobia, or human rights or dignity in any way, they deserve the racism that happens to them because they're, you know, woke. That ill-defined term alt-right conservative spam anytime someone brings up anything that makes them feel uncomfortable. The same James Lindsay who said he could kill a trans person with one punch because there was a picture of him shirtless. Totally a normal, well-adjusted thing to do. Even Twitter, that sewer pit of noxious horse shittery, deemed the tweet inappropriate and took it down, which is why you get a secondhand screenshot. Look, I'm sorry, okay, I did the best I could. But if nothing else, it should be plain to you that James isn't an authority on CRT. He's appeared on PragerU talking about CRT, and I don't know about you, but Chris's claim that he studied CRT exhaustively and done more than just watch Fox News to get his information about it seems flimsier and flimsier, wouldn't you say? Let's look at one of those interviews he linked proving he knows what he's talking about, which is really just a two plus hour long video of Chris shoving his nose so far up Lindsay's ass that I'm surprised we didn't see Chris's face emerge every time James opened his pie hole. This was actually just reflected last week when I did those. I did a couple surveys, a couple of Twitter surveys. Oh, yeah. I didn't know if they were even going to come up in the show here, but you kind of inspired them. And I asked, you know, hey, can racism be solved, basically? And the answer that came back was, you know, about 20, 30 percent, if I remember right. We're like, yeah, no, no, this can't be solved. No, it can't be solved. No, because the yeah. first the first pillar of critical race theory, which is mainstreamed and it is a postmodern approach, kind of. We can talk about that. To. It's mostly, or men, it's deeply postmodern now. Uh, but it, for the first pillar is that racism is ordinary and permanent in American society. And yep. that's in a, a handful of different sources that, that list, they tend to list what it's about. Critical race theorists do. Queer theorists don't. They hate lists. But um, 
the critical race theorists came out of legal scholarship. They love lists. So that's the first pillar that they call it. I mean, that would be Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk uh, call it the first pillar of critical race theory is that racism is ordinary and permanent in American society. Um, so no, permanent means can't be fixed. Uh, exactly. So, look, so I know this is going to come as a surprise to you, but that definition of CRT is wrong. If Chris had actually studied CRT, he should have known immediately it was wrong and stopped his guests to question him. Instead, nothing of the sort happened. The critical thinker at large, that bastion of knowledge on CRT, nodded along with the idea that scholars believe that racism and unjust systemic racism is permanent. It can never be fixed. That's it. Well, would you look at that? The University of Denver teaches critical race theory, and you can see right there that the whole point of critical race theory is to analyze and study the subordination of people of color in America and understand how social structures and laws are used to maintain that control and bloody well change it. You could have used fucking wiki, Chris, and come up with a more accurate definition. Fucking wiki, Chris. Remember that video I mentioned earlier? The one I made about CRT? Well, in it, I used a video by an actual professor of CRT. Have a listen. Critical race theory just says, let's pay attention to what has happened in this country and how what has happened in this country is continuing to create differential outcomes so we can become that country that we say we are. So critical race theory is not anti-patriotic. In fact, it is more patriotic than those who are opposed to it because we believe in the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendment. We believe in the promises of equality and we know we can't get there if we can't confront and talk honestly about inequality. Does that sound to you like someone who has given up? Someone who thinks it's a hopeless battle? Someone who thinks that systemic racism is permanent and unchangeable? No, Chris! Maybe you need to put those critical thinking skills to better use. Listen, Chris, come here. I know I'm being kind of harsh right now. I do. But we live in a time where white supremacy is on the rise. The United States just had a failed, armed, white supremacist insurrection a few months ago. White supremacist groups in the United States are gaining influence and causing violence. You can say the same for Canada and, you know, the rest of the world. In Canada, we recently had a tragic terror attack on a Muslim family that killed everyone except for one member, a nine-year-old, and some of that violence and abhorrent racism is due to the influence of social media and people who put out shitty right-wing nonsense like you're doing, Chris. It's, and I hate this word, <laughs> influencers like you who help radicalize people, make them believe that an academic topic that has been around since the late fucking 70s is somehow a tool for authoritarian rulers to carry out white genocide or some pinecone level shit like that. Oh, and stop attacking trans athletes. And for God's sake, Chris, stop listening or taking seriously people like James fucking Lindsay. He's awful. Le legitimately awful. And he also doesn't know shit about CRT. He's a propaganda mouthpiece, Chris. Just stop. Okay, so actually, we don't have agency under critical race theory or any of its philosophical right. clients to see them. That's correct. They so I wish we had more time to, to unpack your critical theorist, which is an incredible irony because you actually have to sacrifice all of your agency to think otherwise, which is how it chills freedom of thought and freedom of speech, because you have to be critically conscious or else you have false consciousness and are therefore not acting out yourself. You have no actual agency. Of course, we're running out of time, but I'm going to respond just so the audience and the people who watch this on clips don't think that Please. I don't have a response. First of all, sure, sure. The, 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 your, your counter is predicated on the idea that there's a one to one relationship between critical race theory and critical theory as sort of produced from the Marxist tradition, from the Frankfurt School, etc., when in fact, critical race theory has certainly connections to cr any kind of critical uh, intellectual discourse, but it's also connected to critical legal studies, which was not committed mm -hmm. to sort of inheriting all of the all of the kind of uh, 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 Gramscian and Marxian sort of ideas that you're talking about. And again, Correct. even the type of Marxism you're talking about is a very narrow, thin sort of crude Marxism, or even what we call vulgar Marxism, which uh, alleges a relationship between economic base and cultural superstructure that is one to one, when in fact, what most Marxists have argued, and what certainly most Marxists post uh, the, the mid part of the 20th century have argued, is that it's a much more complicated dynamic than even Gramsci himself argues that in the prison notebooks about this idea of hegemony and how it happens along a compromise equilibrium, whereby some people, or, or, or whereby on the one hand, we absolutely are, 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 are hostage 
to the economic conditions around us. But on the other hand, uh, structures and states and institutions also appeal to our own desires and, and our own interests and our own needs. It's a much more dynamic and complicated relationship than you're talking about. And as far as sort of structures, that, the, the, again, you're, you're making a connection between structures in terms of institutional structures that I was talking about and the particular type of structures that, say, a Saussure would be talking about in terms of structuralism. That's not actually what I was talking about. And that's not what most people are talking about when they talk about systems and structures. Again, that's a very tight correlation you draw. But and if we were to accept that correlation, then sure. But it, it's not only that we're not accepting it, it's actually not what we're talking about. And postmodernism, yeah, again, plays upon actually. a range of things. I'm sorry? I said you know a lot about this, actually. That you know a very, you know yeah, a very large mean, amount about this, very much detail. Oh, you're still here? <laughs> well, thanks for watching my video. If you enjoy my work, why not help me make it by supporting me on Patreon? I've decided to not monetize my videos moving forward, so every dollar really helps. And it's not easy being a lefty content creator in atheist spaces on this hell site, but I'd like to work to change that. And you can help me. Link in the description box.